organizations together. I also want to say that there's a, a little packet of handouts that um, you'll be getting and you can, you're all welcome to get these slides as well if they're helpful for you um, in the training that you might want to do with your board and staff. So I'm glad to be here. It's been a super hectic week. So if I look a little disheveled, it's because we've been working 24 seven. Um, it's a totally different I mean, Can you put yourself on mute, please guys? Thanks. Um, so we'll just jump right in. Uh, we are really gonna talk about this special group of folks called mid-level donors. And I see these people as really critical to our financial success. Now, a lot of times when I do this kind of training, people don't really know where the money comes from. I mean, you all are in development and understand it, but it's critical to remember that these folks, these mid-level donors are really the people that can help you get from those donors that we want at the bottom, those, those you know, regular donors who give us small amounts or sporadically give us small amounts, moving on up to the, you know, the gold standard of plan gifts and, and bequests. And when you're thinking about this donor uh, pyramid, which I know you probably all are familiar with, it's that mid-level piece where you really start having those personal relationships and start moving people up the funnel. Um, and the goal of this type of program, the ultimate goal of any mid-level giving program is to do things that allow you to um, deepen your donor's understanding of what you do, and in turn, you deepen your relationship with them. And this is the place where that first level of deepening that relationship and partnership between a donor and the organization it's giving to happens. And the best place to look for these mid-level donors are people who are regular donors who give to you um, annually. They give to you when you ask, but they may be giving a small amount of money, um, but they're giving to you regularly. And that's the folks that you want to really start looking at as you create a mid-level donor program. Oops. And you all are familiar with this move management piece. Um, it's something that Annie and I have talked a lot about, but it really puts the donor at the center and the place where you're gonna start really seeing mid-level donor, um, the change in the way that you use this system is around the thanking, the engagement and the stewardship. You know, with an email donor, you send an email, you may or may not get a donation, you may get it once a year, you may be asking for, you know, support report for America or other things, this group of people, you really start using this full move management system with them. You start cultivating them differently. You solicit them differently. You thank them in a very personal way, which is different than what you do with your email donors. You get to know them in a different way and you steward those relationships in a different way. So this is where this becomes much more personal and, you know, we all talk about funnels in news. This is the funnel that really is about that engagement. And the more you're asking on a dollar amount, right, the more money you are asking people to, to give you, potentially the less frequently you ask them, but you ask them in a much more personal and meaningful way. So I like to think about going up this panel, um, this pyramid, really means that you're spending more time on the solicitation, more time on the engagement, and more time on the stewardship, which means you can do less of these people, right? You can't bite off more than you can chew. So the goal of this mid-level piece um, is to grow the number of committed donors to you, so people who will give to you more consistently, 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 and grow the amount of their giving, okay? And you do that by personalizing the ask more than you do with your general asks. Does that make sense to folks? Is that um, clear? So think less about, you know, it's more about the quality and less about the quantity of the ask. So I'm wondering if we can just throw into the chat, which is our version of small group discussions, in this day and age. You know, where do you think, when you think about your giving strategy, where do you think you're leaving money on the table right now? 
where where are you missing uh, the opportunities to connect in a way that grow the giving from those individuals? And that growing giving meaning leaving money on the table. Yossi, would you mind maybe shouting out some that you're seeing in chat? Because I can't see the chat in my current view. Yes, definitely. So feel free to drop those in the chat, everyone, and, and I can share them. Yeah, where, where do you think like we're not doing a good job? We've got all these people in our email list and then we've got our major donors. Who are you missing in that middle? Do you think you're leaving money on the table there? Lapsed donors is what Catherine Birdie says. Um, Lapsed donors. Getting, spor getting sporadic donors to commit to being monthly donors. And M. Cooper, more personalized follow-up when people lapse. Uh, not taking note of people who've been giving for five plus years as well. Monthly members that give it a higher than average amount but aren't quite major donors. Uh, donors who can give more and identifying higher capacity annual donors and targeting them for outreach. Okay, so I'm loving every one of these is exactly right. That's, that's, this is the exact correct thinking for identifying who might be a really good uh, target for this mid-level giving. So why do you wanna create this program? You just gave all the reasons. You're, living money, you're leaving money on the table. And here's the thing, you know, we all know that most of the money comes from your majors, your major donors, like at the very top of the pyramid. And then there's a small percentage of revenue at the bottom from, that comes from lots of people. And that money is so critical because it shows that there is commitment in your community for the work that you're doing. It grows your mailing list. And it, you know, it's where your mid-level donors come from. But that, that sweet spot are this large group of people that are in the middle that you just talked about, regular donors, people who you know have more capacity. Um, they're not really major donors yet, but they could become some, become them. And the good thing about these folks is that you know they have affinity because they're giving you money already and they're giving you money you know, often or regularly. You know that you can reach them. But at this point, you've got their email address, you probably have their name, you might have their phone number, they've come to events. You can actually get to them in a more personal way. And you know, there's a good chance, oops, sorry, that they have the ability to give more. So they're a critical, critical piece. And the thing we love most about these mid-level donors is they're unrestricted. They're still not program donors, right? They're not giving you money to do a specific thing. They're loving what you do generally. And so this, this group of people are the people that are, you know, that we really, really, really want to target. And if you can figure out who these folks are, it helps you decide who you want to spend your time on. Because, you know, if you've got a mailing list of 10,000 people, 5,000 people, you can't love them all the same, right? You really only have, we only have certain resources. And those of us starting development programs have really small resources. So how do you decide where to spend your personal time as opposed to sort of your mass time? And here's the thing, if you can get these folks to give to you at a higher level, just like you guys said about your monthly donors, they retain better. So this is data from the, that um, came from the Salt Lake Tribune in the years when I was working there. You know, we had people who would give us 60 bucks a year and we'd lose them. We'd lose them in a year. We lose 23, they only 23% stick with us. Monthly donors, we were finding about 60%. But when we put in our mid-level giving program the uh, or a circle or what we called the First Amendment Society, 95% retention rate. And this is, in, this is in the first year. So this is brand new data. These people hang around. They, you know, and you can see the numbers really add up. So this was, this was sort of our target. We had three levels of giving, 1,000, 2,500, and 5,000. We looked at our, we figured out how much money we wanted to raise, and we figured how many targets we needed, how many prospects we needed, right? So the more you're asking for, the less likely they are to do it. So if you want 25 people giving you $5,000, you might want to have 75 in mind. I ran our prospects list and figured out how many people we had in the database that we thought could give at that level. So this is the kind of work you want to do. 
and then what they would actually end up being able to give annually and what that meant if we applied to them three years. So we went from sort of a scattershot approach of, hey, give us a hundred bucks, give us a thousand bucks, give us what you can to, hey, Fraser, can you please give us a thousand dollars a year for three years? And suddenly we went from a kind of a random thinking model to, wow, we could really raise half a million dollars um, pretty easily as it turned out. So this is the kind of table that I'd like you to think about using um, when you think about creating this program. And the good news is, you know, LenFest is a, has a successful program. The Texas Tribune has a successful program. The Salt Lake Tribune has a successful program. This actually works. We're not just blowing smoke at you guys. This is something that you can actually do and do relatively cheaply and relatively easily. It doesn't take a tremendous amount of effort to create one of these. What takes effort is the relationship building to maintain the giving, okay? And to have that personal relationship that you wanna build with people. But you wanna do that anyway, right? You wanna make sure that your donors love you and you love them. So how do you do it? Seven easy steps. I mean, obviously it's not that easy, it takes work. We know that development is really hard work. We know it even when other people don't. This is hard work, but it's pretty clear work. So the first thing is you gotta figure out what are the right amounts for your circle? I've worked at organizations where the starting gift was $5,000 up to $25,000. I've worked at organizations where the, the starting gift of a mid-level gift was $100. It really depends on where you're at. Don't feel as though you've got to be the Texas Tribune. I had that kind of like, oh my God, we've got to be as good as them. We've got to be as good as Lenfest. You are you. So set the right amount for your group. It's going to be different. The tricky thing is figuring out who you want to solicit to join this group. And it's a group, so you have to name it. Now in Utah, everyone talks about membership. In Utah, you are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. No one is a member of anything else. So we didn't want to be a membership program. We asked our donors, what would you like to be? They would like to be a society. Some people like to be a circle. So use a name that is relevant to your community and not something that just, you know, you pull out of a hat, make it personal. You have to figure out what these folks get because it's, they're joining something. So when you join something, you get something, whether it's the Maverick gas card or the Costco membership, you know, you're getting something. So what is meaningful to your folks? How are you going to talk to them? How are you going to communicate with them? And then you have to ask them, and then the big work, you steward them. You create that relationship. And in the handouts that I've got for you, there's a lot more detail about each of these, okay? But here's the, here's the math. How do you actually figure out who these folks are? Now, and there's also more detail in the handout about this. You run your database and you figure out what the median gift is. Okay, not the average, the median. So you're looking at this bell curve. If people, and you look, as somebody said in the chat, you look at what they've given you over a year's period of time. So one person might give you one $1,000 check. One other person might be giving you $100 a month. Okay, so look at the whole, collapse all those gifts together. And then you can see where people are falling out on those gifts. So there's usually a natural break. This is what we did at the Trib. There were a lot of people that were already giving us 500 to 700, $750. There were 200 people, let's say, that fell into that bucket. Those people could easily give 1,000 a year. They're really already on their way. They're, they're there without us even asking. Then there were a group of people who gave between 750 and 2,000. Those people I thought, well, they could be $2,500 donors. Some might actually only be $1,000 donors, but we could lump them there. And then we had people who were giving up to 5,000 and we thought, okay, let's ask them for 5,000. And we actually had a $10,000 level too, okay? So think about those folks. And those are the people that you're gonna wanna kind of put into these buckets of where you think they might be willing to go. 
Does that, does that help? It's math at this point. And you can see how many people you have in each of these buckets. And that's how you can move. Well, maybe it's really only $500 as our entry point because we have a lot of people giving us 250, a couple giving us 500, a couple giving us up to 1,000. So you can move these around to meet your needs. Then there's a bunch of people who give less, right? There's a bunch of people who give less than that. Don't worry about them. Don't worry about them. They're not your targets. So that's what I mean when you start really focusing your energies, focus it where you can, where you need to. And don't worry about the others. Just send them emails. And this is really critical. The ask is personal. So if you end up with 5,000 people in this group, you're not shooting high enough or maybe you're doing something else. You just want to make sure that it's what you and the board can bite off and chew. Because you're going to want to spend some time with these folks. Um, you know, you're not calling them every day, but there is effort involved here that's different than what just a general solicitation. Okay, so name the program and the benefits. Now, um, I like to think about benefits that really are about your product, remember, because what the circle is about is deepening your relationship with them so that you can, you know, ultimately gain more commitment from them, financial and otherwise, and deepening their relationship with you so that they want to give you more. So it's got to be activities and programs that deepen that commitment to your organization and get and allow you to get to know them. So a lot of do people do things that like, one of the things we did at the society right away was meet with the editor, meet with the publisher, get to know each other, get to know the other higher level donors. Um, put, it was tough, you know, obviously we're not doing things in person right now, but you know, get a kind of behind the scenes look. All of that kind of stuff is exclusive, but it really gives them like, wow, I'm, I'm seeing something I don't normally see. And, oh, look, I'm actually spending time with these other folks who also are, you know, exclusive in some way. People like those relationships. And then once in a while, you want to actually do something where the mid-level donors get together with the major donors. Um, I like, I've always done that when I've done these circles because people do like to meet the really major donors, but you do it in a social setting, like a little event before a gala or an event before a special event where people are all in the same room. Ballets and symphonies do this really, really well. They usually have a room at the actual building where you can go and get a, a beverage and you'll see like, oh, there's Mrs. Got Rocks, but I'm only a, you know, $500 a year donor and I'm here with the $10 million a year donor. And it's like, woo, this is fun. So every once in a while you try to do something like that. That's a little bit more. And the Texas Tribune does this beautifully with their big event. What do you want to have on hand to communicate? Well, first of all, you want to have some letter introducing them to this. And this should come from a board member or from the editorial person or someone, the editor, someone, you know, fancier. Always, always, always lead with a thank you. Hey, you know, thank you for giving us five fifty dollars a month for the last three months. Thanks for thank you for giving us ten dollars a year for the last five years. Whatever it is, you lead with a thank you, acknowledging what they've done. When you call, because these are generally calls. Now, not everybody calls. Some do mail. I always called. Don't wing it. Don't let anybody wing it. Write out a, what it is you want to say, because you know what you forget to say you forget to ask them for the money, right? And the solicitation should include like, what do you love about the paper or the, or the website? What do you love about news? Why are we important to you? Why have you been giving to us? Help me get to know you better. If you're asking for multi-year gifts, get it in writing. That's why, the, that's why the retention rate is high. People actually pledge and they sign something saying, I'm gonna give you $1,000 a year for the next three years. That's important. You do need to remind people. And then when you are having these conversations where you're getting to know the potential donor, you're finding out why they love you so much, you're finding out where their kid goes to college and they're majoring in journalism, you find out that they've been a subscriber for 15 years, you write it all down when it's happening. You will never, ever, ever remember 
um, and you won't put it in your CRM or in your spreadsheet or wherever you keep notes, write it down contemporaneously. Right now I'm interviewing and talking to a lot of people for this National Trust for Local News. Um, I'm you know, asking questions, where didn't you get involved in journalism? What did you like about it? Why are you interested in the Colorado media project? And blah, 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 blah. Writing it all down so I can remember to in my thank you notes, in my follow-up notes, say, I'm so excited to learn your daughter is majoring in journalism and this is really great. You know, you wanna personalize it. Okay, so here's kind of what you might wanna have as your communication strategy, as sort of your plan of attack. Somebody sends them a letter inviting them to some sort of special event. This is sort of the cultivation moment, right? So I had Paul Huntsman, now who doesn't you know, open a letter from a billionaire? Everybody loves to get mail like that. Sending a letter saying, I would like to meet with you to talk about my vision for the Salt Lake Tribune. People said, yes, they would very much like to do that. We send it to people who had subscribed to us for a long time, people who had been giving us money, people that we knew were on our mailing list that had money. We held that event. We let people schmooze. It wasn't just all Paul talking. It was also like me throwing out a question. Hey, Jerry, tell me about, you know, you've been subscribing to the paper for 10 years. What do you, you know, what do you love? Get letting people schmooze. Then introduce them to the idea. Hey, we got you together. We're starting this society. We'd love for you to join. I called every one of those people to get them to know them a little bit better to figure out what they liked about our coverage and didn't, didn't ask him for anything, feedback on the event. So that's why you don't wanna invite, you know, invite 100 people. At this point, I, you might do this five times, but I invited you know, 50 people. Then I called him a couple of weeks later and specifically made the ask. And by specific, would you consider joining the First Amendment Society at $10,000 a year for the next three years? Very specific ask follow up with a note, follow up with the pledge form. And once you have the pledge form or the gift, you send them an acknowledgement, okay? So it's very strategic and there's a cadence to it. It's not just random. All of this is really thought out. It's what you can actually achieve and do, for the people you think are most likely to actually support you. And you can have multiple people. Jennifer Napier Pierce, our editor made some of these calls. Paul even made some for the people we were asking $10,000 a year for. Um, you know, but it had to be something that they were willing to do and capable of doing. So inevitably, you're going to ask someone for $2,500 a year, and they're going to say, I can't do that. It's probably you've faced this even with other size gifts. So what do you do when someone says, well, I can't, I can't do it this year, or I can't do it now? Throw some ideas or maybe even take yourself off mute. What have you done when you faced that kind of situation in the past? We'd actually ask them if they want to give at a lower amount or give that $2,500 over two or three years. So I absolutely love that answer. You never say, oh shit. <laughs> you never say, what? You know. You always move it to a different part of the conversation. Could you, so yeah, okay, you can't do 2,500. I totally get that. Could you do 500 a year? Could you do 25 up to 25 over whatever? Absolutely, that is so great. Remember, and we're fundraisers, no is really just no right now. There's always a different way. If they're giving you $100 unsolicited you know, every couple of months, they're gonna, they wanna give you what they can. Any other thoughts? Anything come in on the chat, Yossi? Yeah, there are a couple in the chat. Um, recommend potentially doing the ask over three years like we just discussed, making a note to follow up with them next year as a potential option. Um, and ask them, another option is ask them what they want, what kind of impact they'd like to have at the organization and work with them to, to find it at a level that makes sense for them. That's great, that's actually great. And you know, it's not like we're saying we're not listening to you. We're listening really carefully to you, but we're also letting them know that it's important that their support continues. So if they really say, I just got divorced, I have absolutely no money. You know, 
you take them off the list for hit them up again. But if they say, oh, I can't really do that right now, or can you get back to me? Do be respectful of the fact that they're interested and be sure to follow up. Okay, the big thing about mid-level giving is like your major giving, you've got to steward these folks. You ask them to join on a journey with you, to become a member, to become special, you've got to make them special. You can't just send them the same emails and you certainly can't solicit them in the same way. They don't get the Report for America mass mailing after this. They have been segregated out into a special pot and you treat them differently, you solicit them differently, and you, you do not over solicit these folks. If they're giving you $1,000 a year, don't ask them for $10 a month too. They'll continue if they want to, they'll do both, but you have to be really respectful because nothing pisses these folks off. And I have been pissed off being a member of a couple of these clubs over the years when it's like, God, I thought I gave you a thousand bucks. Why are you asking me for money every two weeks still? I, you know, I really reached to get you that. Leave me alone. And then you have to call them and say, hey, can you take me off the daily email? It's like you guys are the Democratic Party or something. I mean, like, lose up. So stewardship is where we really, the ask is different and the stewardship is different. I cannot emphasize this enough for you guys. This is where people lose their mid-level giverings because people get frustrated. So stewardship starts on day one. And Annie and Terry at the Texas Tribune do this like falling off a log. For some of us, it's, it's a learning process. It means engaging in a personal way and thanking at a personal way. And some of the times that's a gift. Well, what can you give people that is authentic and affordable to you? Because you don't want to get a thousand dollars from someone and then spend 500 on a present. And people aren't getting into this for the present, but what can you give that actually has meaning to them? You know, obviously public radio does the mug thing. We actually gave a little funny pin from our editorial cartoonist who's much beloved. And because of the Olympics, everybody gets into trading pins. So we still carry that pin obsession with us in Utah. People loved it. They wear it, they wear it. Then when they go to the special events, um, listen to what they would like. Uh, and stewardship is really about acknowledging them, recognizing them, i.e. putting their name on stuff, giving them different types of reports that the public doesn't regularly see and engaging with them in different ways. That's what stewardship really means. Here's a little plan, and it's actually in your packet too, of the kinds of things that you might do. And what's critical here is mid-level giving is not major giving. So you don't invite the major gifts to the circle event, right? You don't send them flowers for their anniversary or their birthday. You do a lot of love but it's an appropriate level of love because you still want to put these people in eventually in the major gift pot potentially. Um, and so the major givers get more, right? But you might survey them. You certainly want to, you know, list them on different things online, other places. You want to make sure that they get the acknowledgement that they deserve, but you're holding out just a little bit. Does that help? So there's a whole list of things that you can do. And then um, that's it. That's my talk in a nutshell. I want to make sure that we've got lots of time for dialogue and questions. So um, Yoshi, should I maybe unshare? What's the right way to go about this from your perspective? Um, yeah, I think that would be great. And we can have a bit of a conversation. And there are a few questions in the chat already. And so I can ask those. And if folks also want to drop questions in the chat or just chime in, you're more than welcome to. Um, to start, there are a couple questions along the same line, um, both from Jane Woolridge and Raquel Bennett. Um, and they're both very similar. But when you're beginning to build this a donor database, do you have any suggestions for how to classify who could be a top a, be at the top of the pyramid or a mid-level donor or maybe a, a, at a lower level, if you're just beginning and don't have a database, how would you recommend starting? Okay, so the first thing, you know, when I started out fundraising, I wanted to collect every bit of information about every single person. I mean, if I could have gotten their social security number, I would have gotten it. 
the truth is when we're, we're doing scattershot stuff right at the beginning, um, we're collecting emails because we have lists of people, you know, signing up. We don't have a lot of information about folks. If there's one piece of information that you could get and people don't like, I mean, your data people are going to say, don't do this. It's zip code. Zip code really helps you qualify donors because it tells you where they live. And unfortunately, because of the way our economy works, we can pretty much tell, you can Google what are the highest income um, zip codes in my area. And the other thing I like to do is try and get some, um, you know, if you can get their name. So then you have their name, you may not have your zip, their zip code, you may just have their name and their email. Gather up the public radio, go on your public radio station's um, website and find their circle members. They all have them. And just because we have to acknowledge our circle members, there they are. Grab that list and compare it to your email list. Even if you don't have the names of the people, my email is FraserNelson at FraserNelson.net. It's not too hard to figure out what my name is. So you can see, oh, there's Fraser. She gives, you know, she's a sustainer at KUER. Oh my God, she subscribes to us. She could be a sustainer to us. You know, I mean, she's already made one monthly commitment. Maybe she could do that again. Maybe it's just to get me to give monthly to the paper, but to, to, your, to your thing. But try and compare other donors to your list and see where they fall out. You can spend money to get, um, you know, the wealth, screening. If you've got people's, like I inherited, I mean, I lucked out, right? I had 30,000 names of subscribers of the Salt Lake Tribune. I was uniquely situated. Um, and you believe I ran a wealth screen on all of those people to find out exactly how much money they could be giving. But that was, you know, 5,000 bucks. Well, it was $5,000 very well spent. If you've got a 4,000 member email list, don't spend that kind of money. You're not going to be able to get anything out of it. But fill in the blanks as much as you can, and then really do that thing where you figure out where people might be and do the math. And you know, you're gonna recognize some of these names. You're gonna find them on other lists. Think about like organizations, education, the ACLU, you'll have a lot of overlap there. Um, in, our, in the state of Utah, it was a lot of environmental lists I called. Not so much the symphony and the opera. I went for the ACLU, Planned Parenthood, you know, because the Tribune was the liberal newspaper. Boy, was there overlap. Oh, look, so-and-so gives $5,000 a year to Planned Parenthood. They're giving me 50? No, that's not acceptable. Move them into that next level. I hope that helps. Research, research, research. Um, terrific, another question. Um, when you talk about dividing donors among a bell curve, we have really struggled with how to make these divisions among our donors. There isn't a bell curve for us. There's some high dollar donors, just a few people in the middle, and then a whole bunch of smaller dollar donors. Any suggestions for how to apply your thinking to a situation like this? Well, you've probably all you know, read the story of you know, the librarian that gave $5 a year to the Boys and Girls Club and then left 13 million, you know, and let me tell you, the group that does this better than anybody else are animal welfare groups. We, they are the bane of my existence. We happen to have best friends animal sanctuary in Utah, and they just walk around with a vacuum cleaner, sucking up everybody's money. So there are plenty of people who give small amounts regularly because they are small amount donors but they are actually the people that are the school teachers, they're the people that are the public servants, and they are the most philanthropic per capita, you know, of their own giving than anybody else. It's that, it's that unknown millionaire, right? So who are those people that were in with you early and are consistently giving you five, 10, $15 a month or a hundred dollars every year or at Christmas, suddenly a $500 check shows up or a $100 check, call them. Call them and get to know them if you can. Send them an email and say, you have been such a dedicated donor. If it's $5, if it's 10 and that's your bulk, who are you? I'd love to get to know you. Can we have a phone conversation? And you're not asking them for money. You're asking them about them. 
Why do you love us so much? You were so consistent. We could not do this without you. You know, and you can get to know them a little bit more. You'll get their name for one thing. Although if they've been, they're probably older and have been sending you checks. Checks are another good sign. People who give you checks are older. Older people have more money than younger people, generally speaking. So your check donors are a great group. Um, but try to get to know them and you'll feel out like, and then you'll get their name and you can feel out more of their capacity. You'll want to send them a thank you note for spending time with you. You would want that thank you note to be personal and handwritten. Therefore, you will need their address. Oh, Mrs. Jones, I've really loved this half an hour with you, this 15 minutes. I'd love to send you a note and just a little thanks, thanks for appreciation. Can I have your address? It sounds really sneaky. You know, it's a little bit sneaky, but our work is research. I hope that helps. Um, terrific. Um, the next question is, similarly, we are lucky to have many members, but wondering what criteria is used to tier them. Obviously, monetary giving, but also maybe how long they've been involved. Are there other things you sh should look at to, to help with that tiering? I think longevity and frequency, right? So if they're the people, um, you know, this was what I found with our report for how many of you are, I, I assume some of you are involved with Report for America. You know, we found that with our RFA donors, um, they really love this one reporter, Zach Pad Pad Padmore, who reported from Southern Utah. So it was the, the Bears year, Zion, you know, the, it was right when Trump was cutting the size of our national monuments, people were outraged. So those people were passionate. They were really only passionate about that kind of coverage. They, you know, they liked the Tribune, but boy, they really cared about the environment. So we started a newsletter or a special solicitation to them, or I would send them emails. It's like, hey, we know you love Zach. We know you love the Bears Ears coverage. Here's the story we're doing about the environment generally tried to kind of bring them into the paper holistically. And then once they were, cause they would give anytime I asked about Zach but they wouldn't necessarily give when I just asked generally. When I started moving them into understanding the full coverage I saw that they were starting to give more. So they, we wanted to keep Zach's position, right? So we always wanted to give to Zach but we also wanted to kind of build them into um, this mid-level giving. Now I've left since, so I'm not really sure what happened with that, but we really targeted a handful of those RFAs to move them into our mid-level. That might be a good place to look as well. Try to get them from a specific issue to a general support. Um, Jill, I know you just put a follow-up question in the chat. So if you want to actually ask it, you're more than welcome to. I'm also happy to, to read your question if you'd like as well, but figured it might be easier if, if you want to ask it. Yeah, sure. Um, this is a follow up to the question about the criteria on tiers. So my question is, you mentioned frequency, which I think makes a lot of sense, but I am specifically thinking of someone that I have in my head who has been a regular donor giving us like 10 bucks or something a month. Um, but for like 10 years, you know, um, but all together, he's probably given about $3,000. So I just think it's an interesting case of like, how do you tier someone like that? Like, I definitely think they're major in some ways, but their giving amount is actually pretty small. Well, well, the first thing I would do is I would call them and thank them from the bottom of your heart because they're, that consistent giving is gold. If it's $10, if it's $100, it is absolutely, you're, at this point, you are counting on that money, right? And I would thank them, thank them, thank them. And I would even, you know, break my own rules and sort of treat them as a mid-level donor because they're special. They think you're special and you think they're special. Love them up. It may be that you'll get a larger gift, but you just, I mean, and I had a few of these, honestly, who sort of joined the society and got some of the benefits without really being full fledged amount donors, because, you know, they were just the people who, when you asked, they came through with a gift of $200, $300, but, you know, a thousand over a year. I mean, that's, that's so great. Um, 
Jill, and I think you want to get to know them. And you may find that that gift, and you could say, hey, we've got this society. I don't know if you'd be interested. Don't make a hard push. Just let them know. They may say, oh, I'd love to give you $1,000 a year or $500 a year. I could totally do that. You know, it's like anything else. If you want something, you have to ask. It's interesting. United Way sometimes has these really fantastic, they call them loyal contributor societies. And so the person who's given $10 a month for 10 years is part of this circle of people who've been loyal contributors and their special events and activities geared just for them. And if you have them as a group, then if you have a special project that you're trying to raise money for, you could just do like a crowdfund, like an email blast to them and say, to our loyal contributors, we're trying to hire a new reporter, you know, and we're raising $5,000. Hope you'll think about giving. And then you start to see people, you're not soliciting them one-on-one, -on -one, but you start to see them stepping up in ways you might not have expected. Matching gifts also help with that. Yeah. So it's, you know, one donor says they'll match increased gifts up to $1,000 or something. And that inspires people to think differently about their own giving um, yeah. because maybe it just has never even occurred to them that they could do more. Andy, that's so important. You know, we've really focused here today on this kind of circle level, but there's all kinds of circles there, you know, be creative, do what works for your group. Um, there's no reason to do what I do. You do whatever you want, but just know that what, what you're doing with these, what, you, what you're doing when you start talking about mid-level or what, you, what you're doing is you're filling in the gap between all the people that just, you know, maybe they give you sporadically, they subscribe, they give you here and there, and the people at the very top, like there's that whole big space in between. What do you want to do for those folks? Annie has a great suggestion around looking at your regular donors, um, small lever donors, creating a new thing for them. Maybe there's a donor in the First Amendment Society who'd say, hey, if you can get some of these folks to move over to us, I'll match it. I'll make it possible. You know, who knows what? Be creative. But the difference between the wonderful people that at the very bottom of our pyramid who we love and who we need absolutely and the top pyramid that give us the most money is the engagement. It's finding a way to get to know them differently and have them get to know you differently. And that can take all kinds of forms. Thanks, Annie, that's fantastic input. And oh, by the way, that's what these animal societies do. They have all kinds of $5 a month, you know, meow league or whatever, <laughs> but they know that when you die, they're getting your house, right? <laughs> um, Counting on that big payout at the end. <laughs> And that I think leads is really leads nicely to the, the next question, which is, do you recommend asking for a three-year commitment, multi-year commitment? How do you approach asking for gifts over multiple years? Well, I think that having a circle or a society or some sort of, you know, unlike what Annie, Annie suggested, some sort of extra higher level group, the reason you'd like to get a multi-year commitment if you can is because people follow up on it. They actually do meet their commitments. These are people who probably have made multi-year gifts to other institutions potentially, or they're used to joining this kind of thing. This isn't foreign to them. Um, and the money is money you can count on. I mean, if someone signs something saying, you know, I just, I was a member of the Salt Lake Tribune's First Amendment Society, $1,000 a year. I've left the Tribune, I made my pledge. You know, I'm not going to not pay it. So it's money you can count on and it's unrestricted money. It is money that you can use. You can even say at that point, hey, we'd like to use a portion of this year's, you know, maybe your unrestricted gift to the First Amendment Society as a challenge for this new reporter position. You can kind of move them on mass even, you know, as, as Annie suggested. But asking them for a multi-year commitment takes a little bravery on our part, you know, because you're really kind of stretching yourself in that ask. And, and you got to actually ask for it. You can't just say, can you give us some money? Oh my God, thank you so much. You're saying, we would like you to join this organization that has this purpose for this amount. And we have a three-year commitment. It's a very specific ask. 
It's not random like we sometimes do. Fraser, I know you were really hoping you can do $1,000 a year for three years to be a, I don't know, I think it was a Jefferson or something, member of the First Amendment Society. Ooh, I said, I probably should do that. So you can't do, that's why the script is so important. That's why the theory about the communication strategy is so important because, you know, when it comes down to it, you're going to go, can you just join? Oh, yay. Well, everybody's going to join at the $1,000 level. Unless you say, can you join at the $10,000 level? Deep breath before you make that ask, but you make it, okay? You really have to ask. It also, it gives the donor a little bit of a default too, doesn't it, Frazier? You can, you can, which can be a good thing. If you ask for a gift for of a thousand dollars for three years, they're less likely to say they're not going to do anything at all. They may say, I can't do it for three years, but I can do it for one and we can talk about the future later. Yeah. So sometimes it gives them a little bit of wiggle room too, which is yeah. good because then they don't say no completely. Right. And, you know, see if I like the pin. You know, or whatever the benefits are. You know, if you're, when you're joining something, you do, you know, even if you're joining, you know, Planet Fitness, you want to see what it's like. So some people really do want to kick the tires a little bit. And that's absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. And you just touched on benefits. And we have a couple questions around benefits and board engagement, um, where do you have any ideas for meaningful engagement that doesn't tip into inappropriate influence on reporting? Sometimes I get stuck thinking about things to offer while establishing boundaries um, with the independence of the journalism. You know, I honestly, and this might be controversial, I think we worry about this way too much. I honestly do. I mean, when someone gives a thousand dollars to the symphony, they don't expect to like grab an instrument and be in the, on the band, you know? They don't expect to be dancing around in, in a tutu if they give to the ballet. I think we have this sense that, you know, our donors are going to call up and say, hey, my kids scored a goal at the high school. You know, no, they don't do that. They really don't. Now, I think when you start doing some of the wonderful work that groups have been doing with labs and where there's money for specific types of coverage that comes in in big gifts, yeah, you need to set up some clarity about, you know, what the expectations are and that there's, you know, a gift does not equal a wonderful story about your corporation. But people are more sophisticated than we give them credit for. I think I never ever had an issue of people um, asking this. Now, journalists get freaked out. And when we first started raising money at the Tribune, my God, you would have thought that I was gonna like just give away the store and everyone it was gonna be like, every story would be like, here's another wonderful thing you know, Gail Miller, who owns the Jazz, gave us a million dollars right away. And, and it's like, what, the Jazz are going to win every single game now, you know, or Donovan Mitchell's the best thing since sliced bread, which we actually always wrote anyway, because we legitimately thought he was. Um, no. And I think that, you know, just keeping the journalists' nerves down. But one of the great events that we did early on was we had um, one of our journalists who was writing about COVID, who used to be a sports reporter, who started doing phenomenal coverage, explaining the data and, you know, what, what all this actually meant from a science point of view, because of course, as a, you know, sports journalist, he loves statistics and he would translate statistics for the rest of us. He did an event and it was incredibly well received. All of our big donors came to it. And he didn't feel like all of a sudden he had to lie about the statistics about COVID, you know, or make it look different than it was. And they really appreciated being able to ask him questions. So that kind of interaction with journalists, if you, if you get them to some of those, maybe they'll get over some of the fear of it. Um, that, that's some thought, but yeah, it is, it is something to be aware of, but I think it's nothing to be scared of. I, I, I think that we get more nervous about this when we need to be. I don't know, Annie, if you have the same sense, but that's. No, I do have the same sense. Don't, donors are sophisticated people. They don't think, most of them don't think that they're buying leverage or buying coverage. And in fact, 
they tend to run away from it because the last thing they want is somebody at a cocktail party coming up to them and saying, this paper that you're a donor to, they wrote this about me and my company. What are you going to do about, you know, the, n- nobody wants to be in, 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 involved in that. We have a gift acceptance policy that we put on our website that makes it really clear to folks what we will and won't accept and do. And in some ways, it's just as important for our journalists at the Inquirer to read it and be aware of it to help them with their you know, with their comfort level. But the more you do this and the more they see there's no influence, you know, it's a handful of really terrible donors across the country that have given funding this terrible reputation, um, you know, that there's dark money out there. It's it, uh, The more your news organization sees you accepting gifts and that there's no change in coverage, then it will become less and less of a concern. And remember, these are people who love journalism, right? So they love the very thing that you're telling them they can't do influence that they, they're, they're giving to you because they like what you do. Um, terrific. We have about five minutes left. Um, does anyone else have any other questions or, or thoughts either you want to put in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away? I was just wondering what uh, do, uh, databases you find or CRM management tools you find to be um, exceptionally good for this kind of relationship management with notes and um, and if not a particular brand, what are the, yeah, what are some of the features that you think are really valuable? Well, you know, there's nothing perfect in this world and there's a lot that's very expensive. Um, if you are part of the news revenue hub, you can get a good deal on um, Salesforce, but you can get Salesforce free yourself. And uh, Salesforce has a, has a program for nonprofits. Don't be intimidated by the sophistication of the tool. Um, and don't feel as though you have to have the world's most sophisticated tool either. So I, I would actually, I would encourage you to call your local nonprofits association, your state nonprofits association, and see if they have deals about things. I used something years ago that was very simple to use that I really liked a lot that had um, a way to do, I was involved in a more advocacy program. So it was a way for us to do alerts about things. Um, but I would just you know, shop around. Also TechSoup is a nonprofit technology group that you should all join for other reasons. And you can get discounts there, but you know, Salesforce is pretty much considered a very, very good one, and we do have the ability to get it cheaply. But it's like, you know, it's like the Lamborghini of, you know, you can go down all kinds of rabbit holes with that stuff. So keep it simple when you're starting out. Um, don't overwhelm yourself with data you will never use or fields that you will never look at. You know access, um, and for that matter, Google is not the worst, right? Start with what you've got and what you can afford. Don't, don't sweat it so much. But Salesforce is, if you can get it cheap, it can grow with you. Thank you. This has been a really helpful talk. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks. Um, excellent. I think the other thing with Salesforce is you might have to bring on some outside help. There's plenty of consultants who can help um, you with that as well. So it might be a worthwhile investment up front yeah, as well. Got the money. And you know, the, the, the news revenue hubs tech stack includes some help around, but you know, anyway, it's up to you, but don't, don't, don't let the perfect be enemy of the good. If you really just want to keep things in Excel at first, if that's what you can afford, that's what you got, start there. Don't, you know, keep, keep contacts in your Google doc, you know, it just use your email function and add notes there. There's a lot of ways to get around this. Well, listen, you're going to get these slides and you're also going to get this little handout, but what you really get is, you know, a relationship with your peers and with this fabulous group that you see and Annie and Rebecca are pulling together. So really this is about sharing what's working for you being creative together. I really encourage you to continue to grow as, as development professionals. This is a profession. It's a tough one. Takes a lot of takes a lot of effort. It is bootstrap, bootstrap, hard, hard work. So no matter how many years you've been at it, phone calls make me nervous. 
thinking I'm not doing it right all the time. It's just the way it goes. But the more we do it, the better we get at it. And the most important thing is our donors love us. They love you. They love what you're doing and they want to be supportive to the extent that they can. So give them the opportunity to give just a little bit more and a little bit more regularly and deepen their relationship with you and you they will not regret it and neither will you. So that's Excellent. It. Thank you so much, Fraser. Thank you everyone for coming. This has been um, outstanding. We will um, follow up tomorrow with the recording and all the resources. So um, thank you for being here and feel free to reach out with any questions and um, thanks again, everyone. Thanks guys, good luck, go for it, go get them.